Oh yeah, that's a good one. Oh yeah. Bobby Duke, start the channel. How may I help you? Oh hey Tabitha. Oh, the strike is over. That's great news. Now them actors and writers can get the compensation they deserve. Why would that be bad news? Oh no. Oh god, no. <laughs> Baby Oopsie's back, baby. Nothing can stop Baby Oopsie. We're going to toy hell. Baby Oopsie now. Baby Oopsie tomorrow. Baby Oopsie forever. It's Baby Oopsie's world. We're just living in it. Baby Oopsie. Baby, baby Oopsie. Oopsie. Baby Oopsie. Hey, Oopsie Cats. It's all led up to this. The long-awaited conclusion to the epic three-part Baby Oopsie saga. Will Sybil avert toy hell? Will the villainous Mr. Chung get his hands on Baby Oopsie? Why is Ray Ray able to breathe fire? And the most pressing question of all, what am I talking about? The story so far. Doll enthusiast Sybil Pittman, played by Libby Higgins, does the most pathetic thing a person can do. Makes videos on the internet. She repairs and maintains antique dolls, which I think is pretty cool, but the movie treats like it's childish and pathetic, so okay, whatever. Her only fan, not uh, her only fan, but her own, but the only person who's a fan of her, the delightful Ray Ray Dupree, played to perfection by the singular Justina Armistead. Her neighbor and maybe stalker and potentially best friend, but indisputably best character in the franchise. Dolls are Sybil's only outlet from a troubled life where she is abused at every turn by her horrible stepmother Mitzi and pretty much everyone else she knows. That is, until Sybil received a package containing Baby Oopsie, the murderous piss doll, who she promptly repairs. Sybil and Oopsie don't get along, I should mention also Oopsie can, comes to life and, and kills people, it's important. Sybil doesn't like that Baby Oopsie kills people, but then she changes her mind when she realizes that uh, Oopsie can kill people that Sybil doesn't like, including, but not limited to, Sybil's shitty boss, Sybil's evil stepmother, mother, and various children. Eventually, they run out of appropriate targets and their partnership is dissolved forever when Sybil's housemate Christy gets irrevocably oopsied. Sybil becomes a doll fighter instead of a doll liker, but just when she thinks she's put oopsie down forever, she's informed by her postman that the package containing baby oopsie was sent by Ray Ray. In a stunning twist, Ray Ray is revealed to be the puppet master behind the scenes. So some time passes, and Sybil has been brainwashed, and now is a willing participant in Ray Ray and Oopsie's foul machinations, killing people to gather the mystical power to usher in toy hell or some shit like that, I don't know. Legend, the demon possessed the toys, bringing them to life in a horrific bid to bring hell on earth, toy hell. Sybil is approached by Skipper Beasley, an on-the-nose Barbie pastiche, and offered the chance to manufacture her own line of oopsieses en masse. To this end, she forges two new oopsies ne'er seen before, a clown oopsie and a cowboy oopsie. But she's plagued by visions of Mitzi, who warns her that if she continues her wicked ways, the Toy Master will arrive. And I don't think I need to explain what that means. I don't yet know what that means. Sybil remembers that she wasn't evil, because uh, she, she found her dad's scrapbook or something, I don't know. She enlists the help of Father McGavin, played by LeJohn Woods, who is initially skeptical of her claims until he finds a convenient book of oopsie lore in the church's basement. Meanwhile, Detective Clink, who is... I don't know, man, like a, like a cop or something? More on that later. Is looking into the attack on Sybil's boss and putting together an extremely subtle series of clues which point to the possibility that Sybil may have been involved. But then Sybil donks Ray Ray on the dome with a frying pan, but he breathes fire at her. Oh no, what's going on? There you're up to speed. Did that sound like a disjointed mess? Did it sound like it set up a lot of plot threads which are unlikely to be paid off in a satisfactory way? Fuck you. Baby Oopsie 3 Burn Baby Burn opens on four discrete establishing shots so that we know we're in a church. Father McGavin is in the dusty basement reading all about Toy Hell and the Toy Master. Wow, they've been building up Toy Hell for three movies. I can't wait to find out what that looks like, comma, what it means. Sybil has locked the Oopsies in a trunk while she attempts to... exercise Ray Ray? Ray Ray is possessed by a demon now, and it's unclear how long this is meant to have been the case. The film will go on to imply that he's been possessed from the beginning and that he was never a genuine Satan worshiper, but that feels weird and wrong to me. Feels kind of like they're taking away the character's agency a little bit, but in lieu of agency, they did give him a goofy looking venom tongue, so fair trade, I guess. Please note also the production value on this televangelist they're watching on TV, which looks like it was filmed and edited by like me. One thing that's important to keep in mind with these kind of low budget schlocky movies 
is that they're often not the best showcases of the various talents of the people working on them. Part of the fun is that these things are, are cheap and shitty. You, you just need to put in the bare minimum effort to make it interesting rather than necessarily uh, polished. Anyway, none of that works, and Ray Ray just pukes green slime everywhere and just... Oh boy, that compositing. Oof, holy shit, okay. Sybil doesn't know what else to do, so she just doinks him with a frying pan again. That seemed to work last time. But then she gets a call from Father McGavin, who's like, Hey, Sybil, um, I read up on that stuff about demonic toys, registered trademark, and I think you were right. How can I help you, Sybil? And Sybil's like, nah, man, you're too late, Father. There's nothing you can do because my friend is possessed by a demon. How could a priest possibly be of use in this scenario? Knock, knock, it's Teddy. Teddy who? Th 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 Teddy is Christy's boyfriend. Christy was the roommate in the first Baby Oopsie film. And in case you didn't remember that, the film helpfully inserts a shot of her and also of her breasts to fulfill Full Moon Features' mandate as stated on their website. Full Moon is mainly known for direct-to-video B-movie horror films, notable for using stop-motion puppet effects and featuring at least one scene of fan service. And they don't mean fan service in like in like the way that a Marvel movie might mean it, where they throw in a little reference to some obscure character's little treat for the die-hard fans. There's a list of names somewhere, and they write like the secret identity of NFL Super Pro or some shit, and People watching it are like, oh, I recognize that, that's that guy. No, they mean it in the, in the sexualizing our characters for fan gratification way. And I know this, because if you click on the word fan service, it brings you, and this is not a joke I am making, this is real life, to the TV tropes page for that kind of fan service. Pretty cool stuff, pretty normal website, absolutely normal company. Anyway, Sybil's like, I don't know, man, I, I haven't seen her in a while. And Teddy's like, oh, word, because that's her car in the driveway. And Sybil's like, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know what to tell you. She probably doesn't live here anymore or something. Teddy has no follow-up questions about that exchange. But as he goes to leave, he's approached by Detective Clink. Now, okay, let's, let's dig deep into this. Is Clink a cop or is he simply a private detective? This is the most hotly debated topic of the Baby Oopsie fandom of which I am the only member. And there's strong evidence to support both of these conclusions. For example, he does say out loud that he's a private detective several times. Private detective clink. Case closed, right? But while he does so, he, he's clearly holding out a badge. And I could be mistaken, but I do not think private investigators are issued badges. Hilariously though, I did some Googling and some of them do carry badges that they buy online with like no credentials or anything. Anyone can just buy one. And I kind of want to buy one now. Back of the church, Father Mc... Sorry, I got so ahead of myself. You must be so confused because I didn't include the three lingering establishing shots, which are clearly pre-purchased stock footage to help the audience understand we're in a church. Helpfully, they're also footage of different churches than the other churches we've seen thus far. Undeterred by Sybil's protests, Father McGavin puts together a little exorcism kit very, very slowly. Guess they had to pad out the runtime of this already brief movie. It's just 46 minutes long, and there's just so much padding. As I've alluded to several times now, there's a lot of gratuitous establishing shots, but also a lot of flashbacks. So like, I don't know, full moon, like maybe, maybe if you can't fill 46 minutes, it's unnecessary to split this into two movies. I mean, I get it, making movies is expensive. Sometimes we can't afford the things we want, like how I can't afford this one-to-one -one baby oopsie replica. And if I tried to buy it, I'm sure it would be cited in the divorce proceedings to follow. So I'll have to settle for this Ray Ray bobblehead. Ray Ray convinces Sybil that he, he's back to normal now because the frying pan to the dome got rid of the demons. And Sybil's like, yeah, that makes sense to me. That's good enough. And then he doinks her on the head with a sledgehammer, which does feel like it should kill her, but okay, it just knocks her out, fine. He sets free the oopsies, who delight in torturing Sybil, including using a little toy chainsaw to saw at her leg, which is adorable. Ray Ray begins the ritual to summon toy hell. Finally, finally, we're gonna see toy hell. Aren't you excited for toy hell? Several parties are converging on their location. Outside the house, Skipper is on the phone with the villainous Mr. Chung. He's just cartoonishly impatient with her. He wants these goddamn dolls already. Where are the dolls? He'll kill her if he doesn't get these goddamn dolls. She's clearly got cold feet, so I'm taking matters into my own hands. It's you that will be cold if you continue to fail. But don't worry, Chunzi. She's willing to kill Sybil with her extremely cool and good gun. Note also the cell phone, which is clearly like a Fisher-Price toy, and the bright pink Casio-ass watch. Chung makes this face. This 
pleases Trump. Teddy and Clink prepare to take action as well. Father McGavin enters the basement, resolute in his determination to stop Oopsie and her machinations once and for all. How exciting! What a perfect time to, to slow things down to a crawl with a long montage sequence showing all of the things I just said, like all of the things they have already established, showing them again, but this time to music. A couple noteworthy things happen, though. As Clink loads his gun, we get treated to some acting. Also, this dude, Hickory, who who is in love with Sybil, that was established in part two. I don't remember if I mentioned that in the video. Goes and buys some flowers, which will be important later insofar as anything within this movie could be considered important. Also, Mr. Chung is mad again. Not really sure why, but get ready to see some acting. Okay, so Ray Ray's he's doing the spell. He's gonna summon Toy Hill. Oh boy, I'm so excited. Just when it seems like all is lost and we're gonna get to see something really cool on screen, Father McGavin swoops in to save the day. Exercising Ray Ray pretty effortlessly. Seems like he um, could have done that at the beginning, Sybil. The Oopsies hang back because they're scared of his holy water and his crucifix and shit, but then they attack anyway. They stab Father McGavin multiple times in the brain, which, as far as I know, is a reliable method of killing people. The Oopsies lock Sybil and Ray Ray in the basement and decide it's time for them to roll up their sleeves and bring about Toy Hell on their own. Finally. Finally, we're gonna get to see Toy Hell, probably. Sybil and Ray Ray have an emotional conversation where Sybil explains that she liked dolls because her father would play with her with, with dolls. And uh, we already knew that. That was explained in part two. Anyway, Ray Ray loses patience with it about as quickly as I did and he pulls out a baseball bat and he's like, let's fuck up these dolls. Let's go kick some killer doll ass. Hell yeah, except you are still trapped in the basement, so I guess I guess you'll just have to wait a bit to kick some killer doll ass. Teddy and Clank roll onto the scene, they just waltz right in, which neither a cop nor a private investigator is allowed to do. Oopsie tells Cowboy Oopsie to kill Teddy, and Clown Oopsie... Don't take care of the Popo! So he is a cop, because Popo means cop, Popo means... it's poli police. D does Oopsie just think he's a cop? Are private detectives cops? Clink walks around, narrowly avoiding an oopsie stabbing, while Teddy gets lassoed by Cowboy Oopsie. Cowboy Oopsie starts to strangle him, and he just kinda grabs at the rope. If you just walked closer, it does feel like the rope would go slack, and you'd be fine. Or you could just pull on the rope yourself, because you have the strength of a, of a grown man against that of a one-foot-tall cowboy baby. Howdy, little mess! <laughs> Not that any of this matters because Cowboy Oopsie just shoots him with a little doll gun. Don't know why he needed the lasso then. Clink is savagely doinked by Clown Oopsie, so he just cold clocks him. He's not bothered at all by the fact that alive dolls are attacking him. And he says this. Civil Pittman! This is Private Detective Clink! And I warn you! I'm armed with my weapon truck! I've already Again, he refers to himself as a private detective, but also says he's called for backup. Would not one call the police? Why would a private detective call for backup? He gets stabbed by Clown Oopsie, who says, Book up, Dado! <laughs> which is a police thing. It's a reference to Hawaii Five O, and how does a clown baby even know that? But anyway, private detectives do not book people. I, it just doesn't feel like that's a thing you'd say to a private detective. You would say that to a cop. Also, while we're talking about this, why is his name Clink? I have two associations with that word. One, jail, a thing private detectives cannot send people to. And the second being Colonel Clink from Hogan's Heroes, who's a bumbling Nazi officer. Which like, okay, that's kind of cop-like, I guess. But you know, some pretty bad associations for this character who is neither villainous nor bumbling. Anyway, Clink is then shot by Cowboy Oopsie, because Cowboy Oopsie is putting in the work today. Easily the most effective Oopsie in this movie, which is understandable, I guess, because he is the only one with a gun, and guns are pretty effective killing tools. Skipper investigates the house and is stabbed by Oopsie, but I do feel like Skipper and Oopsie's goals intersected quite a bit. Sure, Oopsie wants to move on to the end game and bring about Toy Hell, which I'm stoked for, still. Failing that, I do feel like a line of mass-produced Oopsie dolls is a pretty solid backup plan for what Oopsie wants. Kind of short-sighted there, Oopsie. Then again, that always has been her tragic flaw, hasn't it? But it doesn't matter, you see, because Skipper is a robot. So this character, who is very obviously a doll, who they've built up to be a doll this whole time, is a robot. This raises a few questions. Why does Chung even want Oopsie? My understanding up to this point had been 
that he wanted a doll that could talk and move on their own, but if he already has a robot, why does he need Oopsie? Like, I thought he was doing this because he figured Oopsie was like a technology that they could use, then he didn't realize it was a demon doll. Or is he, if he is an evil wizard that's trying to get demons, why would a wizard have a robot? Why did he threaten to kill his robot earlier? It's you that will be cold if you continue to fail. Anyway, the stab to the tummy makes Skipper malfunction, because I guess her processor was in her stomach or some shit, who knows, and get ready to see some acting. Rick, I got you, Bill. Can we keep it at 100? I guess they didn't tell Madison Pullins to act like a robot in the scene, so they just added some jerky speed ramps in post and these obnoxious robot sound effects to show you that she is a robot, but why wouldn't she have made those noises before? Was the skin holding back those sounds and you puncture the skin, now you can hear all the pistons and servos and shit? I'm beginning to get the impression they didn't think this through. The ghost of Mitzi unlocks the door so that Sybil and Ray Ray can escape the basement, you know, like ghosts can do. The thing you associate with ghosts is that they're they're very tangible. They're they're better at operating things in the physical world than a, than a person in that world might be, famously, ghosts. The final showdown has begun. Sybil and Ray Ray versus the Oopsies and a malfunctioning skipper bot. Ladder seems easy enough to deal with. One strike with a sledgehammer knocks her face off. And we gotta get the Corridor Digital crew on this, because I have no idea how they pulled it off. It looks so real. Like, one second, it's Madison Pullen's face, and then the next second, it's a robot face. It looks like they just hit her with a sledgehammer. How, how did she not get hurt? I don't understand how they did it. I do love the attention to detail here, how one eye is just kind of twitching erratically. Also, they did preempt my criticism of, of how she was clearly meant to be a giant doll and not a robot with a quick ADR line. <laughs> Because if there's one word I would use to describe a mechanical person, it's... Doll. Skipperbot starts moving very slowly towards Sybil to choke her, while Ray Ray has some trouble with his gun, because instead of shooting it, he kind of just waggles it in the air. Ray Ray is jumped by Clown Oopsie, and Oopsie Classic is about to summon the Toy Master to once and for all destroy mankind. Oh boy, we're about to see Toy Hell. I hope you're excited for Toy Hell. When, what's this? Father McGavin is on his feet after, may I remind you, he was stabbed several times in his brain? Imagine now you're in this scenario. You've got two normal adult humans to help you fight against three baby dolls and one robot. You have, within your possession, a baseball bat and, this is important, a fucking gun. Imagine, also, that you are a devout and pious man of the cloth, someone whose faith and dedication to the Lord is unshakable. How would you resolve this conflict? I'd probably shoot the robot and then just kind of stomp the dolls. We have seen many times that these dolls don't really pose much of a threat without the element of surprise, because they are little baby dolls the size of a baby. Father McGavin uh, has a different tactic in mind. He takes the ancient evil book and summons forth the Toy Master to do his bidding. Mind you, it had never been established that the Toy Master does the bidding of whosoever summons him. I would go so far to say that the word master being in his name does imply a, a sense of independence. But okay, all right, sure. At least we're gonna finally see the Toy Master in action and uh, whoa, whoa, okay, wow, wow. Full Moon can make some pretty fun little guys, funny little monster guys, that's their specialty. But they often struggle when making big guys. It's, that's not what they're known for, it's not their strength. Hey. Why is the Toy Master a clown? I'll grant you that there is a clown toy in the franchise already, too, if you count the Jack in the Box from the original Demonic Toys movies. There is precedent for clown toys, and I understand that clowns have the same mix of childhood innocence and ambiguous horror that a killer doll might, but I do feel, quite strongly in fact, that the Toy Master's design should reflect... toys. If I had to guess, I'd say this costume is either reused from, or intended for, a different Full Moon production, most likely something in the Killjoy franchise, which has a very similar design language. Still, feels like he might have just saved some money on the robot effects and made a new costume which fit thematically with the story you're telling, but I am talking about the third Baby Oopsie film, so maybe I should just cut them some slack. Okay, so that Toy Master is not great, but let's look on the bright side. The arrival of the Toy Master is supposed to usher in Toy Hell. We're finally gonna get to see Toy Hell. When are they gonna get to the Toy Hell? <laughs> First, the Toy Master effortlessly devours Cowboy Oopsie, who, may I remind you, has a gun, 
with and it's bullshit anyway he should be eating clown oopsie because you are what you eat then he's about to destroy skipper bot but chung is watching through this Google Cardboard-ass VR headset, MSRP 1899. Maybe spring for a Vive or something, bro. The screen door effect on that one looks absolutely nauseating. Hey, also, if you're able to see through her eyes and shit, why did you keep calling her and asking what was going on? You could have just looked. So anyway, he activates Skipper's self-destruct function for some reason, which she has for some reason. But whatever, it means the Toy Master is destroyed. I guess a bomb is enough to kill the Toy Master, a bomb that's not even powerful enough to destroy Sybil's house does call into question how exactly this character was meant to end the world. Kind of feels like if humanity had to defend itself against something like that, we... we do have bombs. With the world finally safe from baby oopsie, Sybil has learned to open herself up and look at that, she even got late, she got late even, good for her. She gets one final visit from the ghost of Mitzi, who tells her that the destruction of baby oopsie has finally laid her soul to rest, and she begins to ascend to heaven before a portal to hell opens up and drags her away in a genuinely funny scene. I was I was actually getting mad while I was watching because I was like, Mitzi shouldn't be going to heaven, Mitzi's terrible, she spent her whole life abusing Sybil, why would she go to heaven right at the end? And then the movie played with my expectations in a way that gave me a little smile. Father McGavin and Tur's baby oopsie. S sorry, I really got ahead of myself there. You must be so confused right now. After seven discreet establishing shots so that we know we're in a church, we see Father McGavin and Turing baby oopsie putting an end to her reign of not terror, but discomfort forever. However, Sybil gives us a cryptic warning. The very worst, but not the very last of the demonic toys. Now I think the intent here was to promote the then forthcoming Jack Attack standalone film to get you hyped for the other demonic toy movies, but like, quick note here Full Moon, if Baby Oopsie was the worst of them, that does imply that the other movies are going to be less exciting. But Father McGavin's ready to handle all of these threats. We're coming for each and every one of you, motherfuckers. Also, is it just me, or does it seem like that was not his voice? I think there may actually be some truth to the claims that you were making. I, I, I took your advice, and I went down to the archives. We're coming for each and every one of you, motherfuckers. But okay, I guess, I guess he's the hero of the story now. I do feel like Sybil should have gotten to defeat Oopsie once and for all. In my first Baby Oopsie video, I said that Sybil should have been the monster hunter in a shared full moon universe. Uh, she is more motivated than anyone to destroy these creatures, and we've seen what happens when she nuts up to kick doll ass. But I, gu I guess Father McGavin is going to be that character. Okay, sure, that's kind of a letdown. I mean, he's much more of a traditional hero figure, and... Oh, oh, okay, none of these characters will be in Jack Attack. Cool, good, some good, good choices being made here. Let us address the elephant in the room. We don't get to see Toy Hell, and I am devastated beyond measure. For three movies, we have been promised the appearance of Toy Hell. Now, granted, I didn't realize in the first movie that we were being promised that. It just seemed like a throwaway line. But now, now, this epic saga is finally concluded and my hopes and dreams lie shattered on the floor. And it does occur to me that perhaps Toy Hell, as I imagined it, a colorful realm of twisted evil toys, was probably always more expensive than this series was going to fork over the cash to create, so maybe it was too much to hope for, in hindsight. Still though, maybe you don't talk about Toy Hell so much. Stop talking about Toy Hell and getting me hyped if you're not going to deliver on Toy Hell promises. Let us also address the second elephant in the room. This is a room containing two elephants. Baby Oopsie does not do a big piss for the second movie in a row. What, if anything, makes her Oopsie at this point? All of her actions seem deliberate, calculated even. Baby Oopsie, who I still consider the main Oopsie of this whole thing, doesn't even kill anybody in this movie. And I think that's a damn shame. And I, I hate to say this, but I feel like Oopsie got sidelined. Her defeat is utterly toothless. She just gets knocked over by a baseball bat and then just doesn't move as the house burns down around her. Also, why would you bury baby Oopsie with the demonic talisman that has no purpose other than to bring baby Oopsie to life? That's the last thing you should do, in my opinion. You should probably destroy that talisman. It seems like it's, it's gonna cause you problems in the future. And so we bring to a close the story of baby Oopsie, the murderous pistol, and I'm left underwhelmed. Of course, no movie could possibly live up to the hype that this franchise has generated thus far. I knew that going in, but I can't help but feel cheated. There's so much richness here, so much room for more stories to tell. I want to spend more time with these characters. I don't want to let them go. 
But that's baby oopsie, isn't it? A real entertainer knows to always leave the audience wanting more. The end of this story was always going to be bittersweet. Nothing lasts forever. And if there's one thing these movies have taught us, it's the importance of living in the moment. Learning to let go of the past and forge ahead to make new connections, embrace new possibilities. It's dolls that don't change. They stay frozen in time forever, but people, we grow. We make mistakes. That's what makes us human. That's why we need to lean on one another. Don't cry, because baby oopsie is over. Smile. Because I gotta talk about Jack Attack, are you kidding me? Look forward to my video about Jack Attack. Demonic Toys, Jack Attack, coming soon. We'll do them all. If they keep making Demonic Toys movies, I'm gonna keep talking about them. Grizzly Taddy, Mr. Static, Nicoletto, I don't give a shit. Nothing ends, nothing changes. We're back in the game. Forget the themes, forget all the themes of the movie, forget everything. You're all my baby oopsies now. <laughs> hey, uh, thank you for watching the video. I've been advised by several medical professionals to stop talking about baby oopsie, so I'm just going to go ahead and thank all my patrons over at patreon.com slash scaredycats. In particular, I'd like to thank Joe McClory, Liz Widow, Jacob Lancaster, Annabelle, Mastin Ginger, James Garford, Devin Kaler, Spooky Heather Sylvia, Eleanor Harvey, Definitely Todd, and Danwich Games. And I, Bobby Duke, star the channel who is i cannot stress this enough participating in this particular video under protest would like to thank these other stars of the channel ben danish j tony hoha schadenfraulein lanstentine rachel rat serious bengal kato moore carpad josh manes hyla tracy Louisa Prido, Comrade Rosex, and Jesse. Use all stars of the channel too in your own way on account of your support on Patreon.